Let's go then to objections to the first premise. <clears throat> Bad objection number four. The first premise is based upon the fallacy of composition. It fallaciously infers that because everything in the universe has a cause, therefore the whole universe has a cause. Response to number four. In order to understand this objection, we need to understand the fallacy of composition. This is the fallacy of reasoning that because every part of a thing has a certain property, therefore the whole thing has that same property. Now, while wholes do sometimes possess the properties of their parts, uh, for example, a fence, every picket of which is green, is also green, this is not always the case. For example, every little part of an elephant may be light in weight, but that does not imply that the whole elephant is light in weight. Now, I have never argued that because every part of the universe has a cause, therefore the whole universe has a cause. That would be manifestly fallacious. Rather, the reasons I've offered for thinking that everything that begins to exist has a cause are these. Number one, something cannot come from nothing. To claim that something can come into being out of nothing is worse than magic. When a magician pulls a rabbit out of the hat, at least you've got the magician, not to mention the hat. But if you deny premise one, You've got to think that the whole universe just appeared at some point in the past for no reason whatsoever. But nobody sincerely believes that things, say a horse or an Eskimo village, can just pop into being without a cause. Two, if something can come into being from nothing, it becomes inexplicable why just anything or everything doesn't come into being from nothing. Think about it. Why don't bicycles and Beethoven and root beer come into being out of nothing? Why is it only universes that can <laughs> pop into being from nothing? What makes nothingness so discriminatory? There can't be anything about nothingness that favors universes, for nothingness doesn't have any properties nor can anything constrain nothingness, since there isn't anything to be constrained. Number three, common experience and scientific evidence confirm the truth of premise one. Premise one is constantly verified and never falsified. It's hard to understand how any atheist committed to modern science could deny that premise one is more plausibly true than false in light of the evidence. Now, know well that the third reason is an appeal to inductive reasoning, not reasoning by composition. It's drawing an inductive inference about all the members of a class of things based on a sample of the class. Inductive reasoning undergirds all of science and is not to be confused with reasoning by composition, which is a fallacy. So, this objection is simply aimed at a straw man of the objector's own construction. 